Hi, everyone. Welcome to our inaugural C.S. Lewis College webinar. Tonight, we have the pleasure to speak with Dr. Joseph Lacante about C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, and World War I. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our volunteers and donors who have made this evening possible. We simply could not do this without you. And for those of you that aren't part of that group, uh, if you'd like to join us in living the legacy of C.S. Lewis, we invite you to visit our website, cslewis.org and our college website, cslewiscollege.org, for more information. Uh, next, I'd like to offer a quick note for tonight's call. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll notice that one of the icons says Q&A. This is where you're going to be able to type in your questions for Joe and also vote on other people's questions. Throughout the call, we're going to try to answer as many of these as we can. Before we begin in earnest, uh, I'd like to open with a quick prayer. Lord, while we're sad that we can't be together in person this evening, we're thankful that for this opportunity to meet together virtually and learn more about how you, in your glory, inspired these great writers. We ask you to bless all those who are participating in this call, along with their loved ones, and please also bless our speakers and staff this evening. Amen. Now I'm very pleased to introduce Amber Sullivan. Amber is a professional working musician in New York City as a choral director, and she also serves as church music director at Emanuel Anglican Church. She is a very dear longtime friend, volunteer, and staff member of the C.S. Lewis Foundation, and she'll be leading a breakout session at Oxbridge 2021 uh, next summer. Amber is going to be our moderator for this evening. Amber, welcome. It's great to see you tonight. Good to see you too, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. So this evening, we get the wonderful pleasure of speaking with Joe Lacante. Uh, Joe is an associate professor of history at the King's College in New York City, where he teaches courses on Western Civ, American foreign policy, and international human rights. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller book, A Hobbit, A Wardrobe in a Great War, the book that we're all here to hear more about. Mr. Lacante has previously worked at Pepperdine University and the Ethics and Public Policy Center in DC. He's written a couple other books, which you might want to take a look at. God, Lock, and Liberty, The Struggle for Religious Freedom in the West, The Searchers, A Quest for Faith in the Valley of Doubt, and The End of Illusions, Religious Leaders Confront Hitler's Gathering Storm. But the big news about Joe is that he has a new job. Joe will be joining the Heritage Foundation in June as the director of the B. Kenneth Simon Center for American Studies. That's a wonderful thing. Now, Joe, I went and texted some of your students to ask a little bit more about you to see if we could get to the human side of you, Joe. So here's what I've learned. I've learned that you like to wear jeans, which is not in accordance with dress code policy. <laughs> I've learned that you play music before your lectures, that you're always telling your students to crack on, and that you're famous for your final lecture of Western Civ II for being so beautiful that it always made your students cry. I think that's wonderful. Welcome, Joe. Amber, thanks so much. It's great to be with you and everybody here at the C.S. Lewis Foundation, all our friends. I think if the students were crying on the last day of class, it's just tears of joy that they're done with Lacanti for another semester, but thank you for that. <laughs> Well, it was, it was said to me as if it was the, a beautiful, important moment. So that's a great thing. <laughs> we'll take it that way. All right. <laughs> so we're here to talk about The Hobbit, The Wardrobe, and The Great War. And um, there was a moment in 2014 uh, when the, we started gathering um, people together at the centenary of the beginning of the war. And at the Tower of London, uh, where in London, where I lived at the time, they had this great art installation um, where they, someone, some amazing person made poppies uh, and the red poppies 
for every um, British soldier who had died. And I went twice to see this installation. The poppies were everywhere. They filled the moat, they, they towered down from the windows. And because they were red, it was like the whole of the moat of, tower, of the Tower of London was, was red with blood. Wow. What an amazing yeah. way to look at this war that um, changed the whole of the 20th century. Yes. So why is World War I so important for us to understand? I it, certainly growing up as an American, I felt like World War II was the war. That was the one my grandfather fought in, the one I saw all the movies about. But, but why was World War I so important? Yeah, that's a terrific question. And Amber, thank you for that poppy story. I was also in London actually during the centennial and saw some of those poppy displays. Yeah. But the, the, the poppy was the first flower to grow in the, in the decimated earth. And it, it, this gets to your question. Why, why is the First World War so important? I mean, uh, I think in, in part because it, it set loose so many different forces in the world that uh, became so disruptive and destructive. And uh, if you think about it, we had uh, Marxism had already been around in, in, since the 1850s and 60s with Karl Marx, but, it, but communism wasn't really going anywhere. But after the First World War, it really takes off as a political ideology. And you'll, then you'll see communist party movements in, in most of the countries of Europe. And the same thing happens with fascism. So you'll see the first fascist movement begin, uh, I think in, in 1921, it really takes, takes off in Italy under Mussolini. And then it just sprouts all through Europe. And so part of what the First World War did was it created a, a great sense of, of disillusionment, of, dis mm -hmm. of great discouragement and cynicism about what the Europeans had kind of done to themselves. You know, mm -hmm. these liberal democratic states, supposedly Christian nations of Europe, that had essentially engaged in this massive kind of suicide pact mm -hmm. uh, with over 9 million uh, soldiers dead and then millions more wounded, much of Europe devastated. So it just seemed to set loose these forces, communism, fascism, eugenics, uh, scientism, it just takes off after the First World War, and it helps then to define really the rest of the century. Wow, you, you said a lot in there that I want to unpack. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's great. It's a wonderful way to start. And I, I do want to remind our, our uh, people who are watching that there is the Q&A button. So I have lots of questions that I'd like to ask Joe, but perhaps you'd like to say something that would uh, tag on to that. So please do write in the Q&A. I can see those questions and uh, we'll, we'll get to those when we can. So um, I just kind of want to tee up like what the world was like. Uh, I was really fascinated in your book by the description of, of what was happening in the aughts and in the early teens uh, um, in the, the mind of the people in Europe and America too. Uh, and you call it the myth of progress and half the time you just call it the myth, you know, capital M. So what, can you remind us, what is this myth of progress? What was it that people believed? Yeah, it's a fabulous question because it's going to help us to understand how Tolkien and Lewis were so uh, out of step with the mood of their times. Yeah. Part of the reason for the disillusionment after the First World War was the idea that, hey, uh, the European civilization especially, everything is getting better uh, every way, uh, every day. Uh, mm -hmm. And this began really with Darwin and the evolutionary theory that then becomes kind of a social theory. And so if you think about what's going on in the years leading up to the First World War, you have all these inventions coming online. You know, everything from the escalator, I think in 1900, we get the first escalator kind of symbolizing man's evolutionary ascent. And from there, it's the Wright brothers in 1903. It's, it's Albert Einstein with his theory of relativity in 1905. Uh, you get, I think, the first vacuum cleaner. You get all kinds of things coming online. Uh, in, the, in those years leading up to the First World War, and people begin to assume that technological progress means moral progress and mm -hmm. spiritual progress, and the idea that we can perfect ourselves, maybe even perfect human nature. Hence, the idea of eugenics also takes off during this period, manipulating the human gene pool, you know, through all kinds of crazy policies. But this idea that things are just going to get better and better and better, not just technologically, but morally and politically, a more peaceful and prosperous world, and then bam, 
you get the trenches of the First World War and it countries is, rushing to stalemate, yeah. Yeah, it was astounding to me how quickly that, uh, that turning process happened. So for instance, I'm reading from your book here about the 1914 edition of the peace yearbook from the Britain's National Peace Council. This was published in the year the world started. Yes. Said, peace, the babe of the 19th century is the strong youth of the 20th century. That, what kind of an optimism, uh, and yes. do you think maybe it was an over, I mean, clearly it was an over optimism, but do you think that over optimistic -ness, it's, you know, reached clearly reached a zenith in 1914 but did that then affect how deep the plunge went later yes. that's an excellent question if i could quote from c.s lewis on this because as a young man he's uh you know by the time you get into 1914 war he's about 16 years old and he himself admitted as as a, as a young atheist that he was also caught up in this idea of human perfection it was such a grand idea here's what here's how lewis put it I grew up believing in this myth, and I have felt, I still feel, it's almost perfect grandeur. It is one of the most moving and satisfying world dramas which has ever been imagined. It's just such a compelling vision, you know, of human perfectibility. And so when it doesn't happen, when the world goes to war, they called it the Great War because they had no mental category to describe what was happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, 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 it's hard to overstate the level of sort of disillusionment that then goes on at one level, given the myth, given the assumptions of human progress. Uh, so it really sets up all these countries for a real kind of, um, uh, I think, a willingness to believe all kinds of alternatives, all kinds of political <laughs> alternatives to Christianity, to democracy, uh, mm -hmm. to capitalism. All those things look like they failed. Let's try something else. Yeah, you, that's amazing. I can only imagine the kind of optimism that must just sweep a people. Um, and I'm not sure I felt that in my, in my time. I, I was brought up in the 80s and 90s and, and just that feeling that everybody is on the same page and we're all going somewhere so fabulous. Um, that's, that must have been just an amazing thing to have lived through and, and felt. Yeah. You um you mentioned nationalism um a, a little bit ago, but also nationalism in the book was sort of a, a a a driving theme. I was fascinated by how nationalism, both for the Allies and for the Central Powers, played such a big role yeah. in both sides believing they were doing the the right thing. Yeah. Um, and especially the sense of of mixing it with with faith. Yes. You know, both sides saw themselves as God's people. Yes. Uh, can you ha, tell us a little bit more about that? And, and perhaps how can we guard against that? I mean, how can we learn from history? That's a terrific question, Amber. And it will connect uh, to Tolkien and Lewis here in a moment pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. I think what's going on at the, at the beginning of the 20th century is because the power of religion, it's weakening, especially in Europe. And, and people's genuine beliefs, whether it's in Judaism, Christianity, they're more and more disconnected, disconnected from their faith traditions. And well, but the heart yearns for spiritual, eternal, transcendent things, right? Yeah. Uh, and so you find a substitute and the substitute becomes nationalism, politics, politics, the nation state becomes a kind of idol for a lot of people uh, on both sides of that combat, the Germans as well as the French and the British. Mm -hmm. And so you have this kind of Christian nationalism. Every nation believed that it's, it's, it's got God on their side. And of course, that can make a war more vicious and more protracted because if God's on your side, that means God's not on the side of the other guy. He's in Satan's camp. And so that means no compromise. You take it to the bitter end. And where I think Tolkien and Lewis kind of responded to some of this in their own writings even, if you, if you think about the Lord of the Rings and the Chronicles of Narnia, and I know we'll get to it here uh, pretty quickly, uh, I think Tolkien and Lewis, having come out of their experience, they're going to avoid any kind of triumphalism uh, in, in wartime. I mean, if you think about the, those stories, which are really war stories, the Lord of the Rings and the Chronicles of Narnia, they're really right. war stories in a lot of yeah. ways. But the heroes, they are, you know, they're heroes who are flawed, and they hope they're doing the right thing, but sometimes they're just really tempted by the dark side. I think that's a very intentional thing for Tolkien and Lewis who had seen 
men and women, the generals and the politicians in particular, in insisting that God was on their side. But their characters are much more humble, I think, and much more careful about that kind of, you know, God is on our side kind of mentality. That's a fascinating point. <laughs> because in, in those books, you know, we see um, Narnia and Lord of the Rings, we see characters and, I'm, you know, you're picking up one of my later questions, Joe, but we see characters that are, are um, so multifaceted. Yes. And, and so many of the characters are tempted by the dark side. You know, you think yes. of, of um, uh, Gandalf, you know, who, it, who knows he can't touch the ring. You think of Boromir who wants the ring. You think of, of course, Gollum, um, but even Frodo in the end who, who falls. Yes. Um, that sense of, of, of always fighting with oneself must have been, I, I, how would they have felt in the trenches? Do you think they would have had that same feeling of, of, of doubt? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the right question to ask as we think about what really animates the works of, of Lewis and Tolkien. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the will to power is one of the enduring themes that as part of the reason it still speaks to us today yeah. They're so uh, aware of the temptation to power and to abuse it. And it's not only the First World War, and this has been one of the great discoveries for me working on the, on the book, but particularly the film project, is that not only have they fought in the First World War, but now they've got to uh, fight, now they have to endure a Second World War. They have to live through that. And let's think about it, there's, there's nobody alive today who fought in the First World War and then had to live through a Second. I think the fact that their lives were bracketed by war really explains a lot about how their literary imagination went, the direction that it took. For example, Tolkien was once uh, kind of uh, accused, if you will, accused of using uh, the Lord of the Rings, the Ring of Power as kind of a symbol, a metaphor for the atomic bomb by the mm -hmm. time his book comes out in the early 1950s. And Tolkien just sets him straight. He says, of course my story is not about atomic power, but about power. And the, and the desire to use it to dominate others. He just lays it on the line specifically. It's not about atomic power, it's about the will to power. Yeah, wow. And the will to power, I mean, the, as Christians, that's something that we always, we're, we struggle with, right? How do I, how, how do I give up my power, how, in, in a sense? How do I give up my self-autonomy to yeah. God who, who deserves that, really. He created me, he deserves my allegiance. I need to then, you know, live, live with him. Um, what, what was the role of, of um, what do you think, the, what was the role of Christianity on the ground in World War I? You know, what, what were the soldiers feeling? What was that sense yeah. like? Was the church speaking to soldiers on the front lines? Yeah, it's an excellent question. It, and it's a, it's a, it's a somewhat of a layered kind of answers to it, but I think the, the ordinary average soldier, um, they have maybe some nominal belief in God or in Christianity, kind of a cultural Christianity going in. Mm -hmm. uh, there certainly are, I think, uh, whether it's the uh, various priests or ministers who seem to be really convinced that God is blessing their particular military and God is on their side. So there's that kind of Christian nationalism, you could argue, with the ministers. I think the ordinary guy in the trench, when you look at the letters that they're writing back and forth, I think there's kind of a lot of confusion about God allowing this kind of conflict with the intensity. Think about it. The, for the first time, what's being introduced is, is the, the industrial slaughter of, of soldiers, right? The bombs, uh, the, the mortars, the poison gas, the barbed wire, the thousands of miles of trenches. I mean, they have no mental category for the bombardment on the trench, the pounding hour after hour, never being able to escape it. You know, the whole idea of the shell shock uh, uh, soldier, that term we still use today, shell shock. Well, it goes back to that, that moment. And that literally became kind of a metaphor in some ways for the European mind, a shell shocked European mind. They can't quite grasp what's happened to them. So the impact of the technology, the, the optimistic assumptions, and then, of course, the shattering even of the notion of God, of a good God. Lewis, as you, as you know, uh, is an atheist going into the First World War, he, and he remains an atheist. Uh, he, is an, he is an atheist in a foxhole, uh, and it'll be the influence of J.R.R. Tolkien, this committed Catholic Christian, who'll have a real influence on, on Lewis by the time they get to Oxford there in the 1920s.
Yeah, yeah. I I want to I want to get to some of that friendship stuff in the trenches. Sure. Um, because how you know you 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 um you researched a lot about what Tolkien wrote in the trenches, how he was writing to his friends, but some of the poetry that happened, a lot of it reminded me of. Um, can I read a poem to you? This Please. is a Wilfred Owen poem yeah. from World War One, uh, the the famed poet uh, who was friends with um, Sassoon, and thinking about this conflation of of religion and war. So. Um, this is a poem about Abraham and Isaac. So he sets up the Abraham and Isaac story. Clearly he's um, uh, talking about it. So I'm going to jump to the middle of it. Um, then Abram bound the youth with belts and straps and builded parapets and trenches there and stretched forth the knife to slay his son. When lo, an angel called him out of heaven saying, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything to him. Behold, a ram caught in a thicket by its horns, offer the ram of pride instead of him. But the old man would not do so, but slew his son and half the seed of Europe, one by one. Uh, and I was so, this is from uh, Benjamin Britten used this in his War Requiem, which was uh, a response to World War II. But that sense of uh, religion is holding me fast, um, and I know these stories, and I'm holding to these stories, and yet when they get to that crucial moment, it's turned. Yes. Um, there was a, uh, there was a, one of the, well, I don't want to get there. I want to wait on that question. <laughs> 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 because that that was a big question for later you um you talk about how realistic lewis and tolkien's descriptions are um the the war and uh what they felt on the front lines and how then that uh, found itself into um the lord of the rings and the chronicles of narnia can you remind us a little bit about some of some of the ways those interplayed? Yeah, thank you for that, Amber. And we're still kind of exploring that uh, mm -hmm. here as we work out the film series too. But and mm -hmm. it's both positive and negative. So, for example, um, uh, on the way to Mordor in the Lord of the Rings, Sam and Frodo, you know, this desolate land, and that in, that really poignant, frightening scene when Sam falls face down in the water and you, and you have the lines, dead things, Gollum starts, starts screeching, dead things, dead things in the water in the dead marshes. And you might imagine that this is a completely fantastical tale that Tolkien just invented out of his head, but it's not. Yeah. When you think about what the soldiers in the trenches in the First World War really experienced, men would often be left uh, in those uh, sunken craters that have that would fill with water and soldiers would be left there uh, for days or weeks on end undisturbed and then you would find them you'd find the bodies going past so the, the description of the dead marshes according to a, a, a whole bunch of World War One historians it matches precisely Tolkien's description uh, his description matches precisely what those men experienced there at, at the at the Battle of the Somme where Tolkien fought uh, in 1916 in France. It's pretty frightening stuff. That's on the negative side, uh, Amber. We do have some positive, though, examples, too, if I could jump in there quickly. Is that all right? No, please do. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's the dark side. That's the dark stuff. Uh, and those images that I think really do literally work their way into their, uh, their narrative works. Uh, even Lewis, though he's writing for children, his the, the, uh, descriptions of battle are amazingly intense and realistic. Mm -hmm. But think about The Hobbit. You know, you always, we always kind of wonder, how did Tolkien get his idea for The Hobbit in the first place? Mm -hmm. And he describes in a couple of different letters, he says, you know, my hobbits, they were made small to show up in, in very small creatures, to show up unexpected courage uh, and fortitude uh, in a pinch. And he said that he based his hobbit on the ordinary English soldier the 1914 soldier that he served alongside. And then he, he adds, and who I considered far superior to myself. There's a real humility to Tolkien as a soldier. He was so deeply impressed with these, these English soldiers doing their duties, staying at their post and performing really great acts of sacrifice and heroism as soldiers always do in battle, despite the horror and the struggle, right? 
Right, right. And it's just and amazing to think about, isn't it, Amber, that the, one of the most popular characters in all of fiction, The Hobbit, is based on this World War I English soldier. And ha having lived in Britain, I, that makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> that <laughs> that the, the, uh, the sense of the love for the common person and that, that fortitude in, yeah. in the normal person uh, doing their duty walking into a path that they didn't choose. I mean, how often did Frodo say, I don't, I don't know, and Gandalf was like, you were chosen for this. You know, you bring out that sense of, um, is it, is it, is it a, a choice or is it destiny? You know, and that, that intermingling with these characters, yes. uh, their struggle with, what it, I, I've been given this choice, what is the line? All we have to do, you say it. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Uh what matters is what, what do we do with the time that's given to us? Yes. The time that's given to us. And Frodo, as you say, I was not made for perilous quests, right? <laughs> Don't we all feel that way? We're not made for perilous quests, and yet there's a calling on their lives. And that, that one of the most, I think, um, exciting things to discover uh, with the book and the film project is how both Tolkien and Lewis, I think, the First World War and then the onset of the Second World War, they have a strong sense of their calling as writers. And they're mm -hmm. gonna pursue their, their great uh, mythic tales with all the obstacles and distractions in life because of this deep sense of calling. It's really profound for both of them. It's so challenging. Great, I'm sure we'll get more into it. Well, yeah, let's talk about that because they, you know, they, they leave the war, they don't know each other yet, and yet they both have the same thing, a trench fever, is that right? Well, Tolkien will experience trench fever and he'll survive that. Lewis, though, will almost be killed. The mortar shell goes off close to him. Uh, it kills his sergeant. It wounds him in three places, knocks him uh, essentially unconscious, but he survives those wounds. So they get out of the war intact. Right, they both come home. They don't know each other yet. They both go to Oxford. And the mind of the society has dramatically shifted now. Now we're in the 20s, right? Now people feel completely different about the world. Tell us what Oxford was like in the 1920s. Did they both start to uh, teach in like 24, 25? Am I getting my dates right? No, that's about right, yeah. They're, they're there, uh, uh, 1925, they're both there. They meet for the first time. Uh, a, a faculty meeting in 1926 as a, a, as a college professor. You know, faculty meetings, we all just dread them because there's so much drudgery and all, you know, internal politics. But this is probably the most important faculty meeting like in the history of the 20th century, right? Between <laughs> right. Because they go on to become great friends. They begin to figure out they have all these things in common, the, the love of mythology, the love of great epic stories. But Oxford in the 20s is, is changing. There's no question about it. Think about it. T.S. Eliot, by the late 1920s, he's publishing The Wasteland, right? Mm. Uh, and that, so that mood of kind of agnosticism and skepticism and increasing hostility to Christianity, they're, they're seeing that as early as the late 1920s. So by the time Lewis and Tolkien uh, get to the 1930s, and when uh, Lewis becomes a Christian in, in 1931, and then uh, by the time he gets to the, you know, those early 30s, uh, Lewis will turn to Tolkien at one point and say, all right, Tollers, that was his nickname for, for Tolkien, all right, Tollers, if they're not going to write the kind of books that we want to read, we're going to have to write them ourselves. And what he means by that is people just aren't writing stories anymore where the individual matters where this yeah. capacity for real heroism and virtue and sacrifice for a noble cause. So the idea of the ancient mythic hero reinvented for the modern mind, I think that's Tolkien, that's one of his great achievements and for Lewis as well. But no one else is writing those stories essentially, you know, in the 1920s, they are, they are out of the box. Yeah, that's such a message for artists. You know, I'm I'm a musician, not a historian, and I was so uh, I got so much out of your book. Thank you. Thank but that's you. such a message for artists: is what needs to be told today that no one is saying, and what what can what can we be uh, writing? And it, I I shut my book for a minute and thought, okay, what is it that I want to hear? What is it that I want to see? And how can I follow in that 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 footpath? 
Yes, yes, Amber. What kind of music do you want to hear? You're going to have to write it. <laughs> yes, yes. It's actually quite exciting living and walking in the, in the paths of the great people who've come before. Uh, since we're in the 20s, I, we've had a question about fascism for a while, and I did want to address that before we move on. It's, um, Annie has asked, fascism has been redefined, especially in very recent years. How is fascism properly defined? Well, you know, the way that Mussolini defined it with his doctrine of fascism, and I'm also, I should just say quickly, I'm an Italian-American, so I love to pick on the Italians and their whole, uh, you know, as the first fascist country here in Europe, the first fascist country to dispense with liberal democracy. What Mussolini said is fascism uh, regards the state as the ultimate entity, and the individual must subsume himself within the state, and the individual really has no meaning no moral meaning, no spiritual significance outside of the state. Uh, and you will find your destiny and your ultimate value and meaning if you serve the state. That is the classic definition of fascism. It tends to be race-based, you know, in, in the Italian context is, you know, it's, it's restoring Italian greatness, the greatness that was Rome. In the German context, of course, it's Germany, the German Volk. Uh, uh, and it defines itself often against other races. In Hitler's context, of course, it's against the Jews. So fascism is definitely a race-based kind of ideology as opposed to communism, which is really class-based. It's all about, you know, leveling the classes and doing away with property. The fascists aren't going to do away with your property, but they are going to do away with your individuality. And that's going to be subsumed within the state. So it's hard to say, is it politically left? Is it politically right? I think some of those labels don't make a lot of sense. It's the state. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Appreciate that. So it's let's. Important, uh, quick, I'm sorry, Amy, real quickly. It's an important question because I really believe what we forget as Americans that Tolkien and Lewis, they have a ringside seat to the rise of fascism in Europe. I mean, a ringside seat. It's just the English Channel, you know, so, uh, separating England from what's going on on the continent by the time you get to the 1930s. So they're, they're watching the rise of these fascist leaders and demagogues and communist dictators the will to power, the totalitarian state. I mean, Britain is watching it. What Winston Churchill called the gathering storm. And they are close to the thick of it. Unlike we, America, you know, we're separated by two oceans. We suffered the least in the First World War. We're kind of insulated from all of that. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I had, there, there's, a, there's a war museum in Northern France. Um, I can't think of the name of it, but it's in Ken. And it, it, the whole museum itself is designed um, to show that gathering darkness. So you walk in the, op the, the opening, you know, the vestibule is high and lit and all the windows are open and it's beautiful. And as you go through the museum and it talks about the 20s and the 30s and in, um, well into the end of the 30s, you, the rooms start to get smaller and darker but you don't really notice what's happened until you're in a room that's like this, thinking, what is, you know, what, and it's dark and there is no light and you're underground and you can't, and you're thinking, I want to get out. I don't know how, how did we get here? Um, what a brilliant, uh, what a brilliant way to describe what was happening in those years. Oh, wow. That's so a Lewis and Tolkien are in Oxford, right? Yeah. Um, and they now they know each other by this time, <clears throat> and they're watching what's happening right in the intellectual society. Um, what is happening in their in their friendship with each other? Like, how are they growing? Yeah, it's it's you know it's it's the most one of the most exciting parts of the story. Of course, is is for the first time in film. What we hope to do here is to bring that story to film how important that friendship is. Really one of the most consequential friendships of the 20th century when you think about their, their influence. So uh, a very quick kind of summary of it. They, they begin to figure out how much they have in common. Uh, by, by 1929, uh, Lewis is writing uh, to a friend. He writes a letter to a friend and he says, had that, um, that Anglo-Saxon professor Tolkien in, in, in my room last night, we were talking about the gods of Asgard till two in the morning, but who could turn him out the fire was good, the, the talk was so good and the fire was so warm, who could turn them out into the night? So they're beginning to figure out they've got all this stuff in common, but Lewis is still an agnostic, maybe he's moving toward theism. It isn't until 1931, 
And I think this is the grace of God. I think probably only a token could get to C.S. Lewis and unlock a, a door that had been shut in his mind. And the door was this. Lewis, as an atheist, just thinks, you know, Christianity, it's a myth like all these other ancient myths. There's no real truth value. It's just a myth about a dying God who maybe comes to life and maybe doesn't. But it's all, it's all fictional. And what Tolkien helps him to see is that, you know, wait a minute, Lewis, the, the stuff you love in these ancient myths, the heroism, the sacrifice, the idea of something transcendent interacting with the earth for some noble cause that you've encountered in these ancient Greek and Roman myths, think about Christianity as the myth that became fact, the true myth, the, the great, the grand myth that became fact, uh, from which all the other myths are just their, their intimations of the true myths, their, their shadows uh, and, and glimmerings of the true light, the myth that became fact. Now, when, that, when they have that conversation, talking till three in the morning in Addison's Walk in Oxford, and you've probably been there as well, Amber, that yeah. lovely little walk there outside of Maudlin College, uh, that is transformative for Lewis. That opens up a door to his mind and takes down, I think, some of his prejudice and defenses about it. But I think only a token with his intelligence, with his Catholic Christian faith, with their shared love of mythology could break through Lewis because it's really within days that he begins to figure out, you know, I believe in Christianity. And then shortly afterwards, he becomes a Christian. He trusts yeah. in Christ. And he says that conversation was really the immediate human cause of his conversion to Christianity. I mean, wow. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've known this story. I love this story. I'm compelled by this story every time I hear it. And yet when I was reading your book, I just kept thinking, what if they had been friends on Twitter and just kept talking back over each other? That there was something so real about their friendship because it was real friendship yes. and they were able to go back and forth all the time you know in at dinner in each other's homes over the fire um you know with a good cigar and just and and arguing and and really getting to the nitty-gritty of it yes. and what a model for us of what true friendship is yes. and i was really convicted about well who's in my life that I don't agree with now, but it, that's in my home and, and is sharing my life and playing with my kids and uh, who am I really uh, sharing life with? Yes. It's such a, a, a word for us there. Yes, it's a um, tremendously important word. If I could add to it quickly, uh, it's, it's not only a uh, token of Lewis, and I think this is part of the war experience. Remember, we forget mm -hmm. this. We have the idea of band of brothers, the Second World War in our mind, and we forget that the guys who fought in the First World War, it was the same kind of intense camaraderie, the yeah. guys in the trench with you wh whose lives you're, de you're depending on, right? Yeah. Um, and I think they wanted to recapture somehow that sense of comradeship and fellowship. It's not an accident that Tolkien's great work is called The Fellowship of the Ring, right? The Fellowship of the Ring. So what they do, not only their own friendship, they, they're the nucleus for this larger circle of Christian friends, writers, all of them really, uh, who come together, the Inklings, those who dabble in ink, uh, who meet you know, every Tuesday at the Eagle and Child pub there in Oxford every Thursday night. And I think that's the really crucial night, Thursday night, when they're sharing each other's literary works and reading them out loud. I mean, Tolkien literally read just about every chapter of The Lord of the Rings out loud, either to the Inklings or to Lewis himself over lunch or some other gathering. And Tolkien says explicitly, I never would have brought The Lord of the Rings to a conclusion without his, Lewis's, constant encouragement and demands for more. <laughs> Again, wow. If you ever want a time machine, I know sometimes we think about, oh, I'd like to go and meet, you know, this amazing person. Yeah. But hearing Tolkien read that out loud would have just been amazing. Oh, oh. you'd cut so, off your right arm for that. Absolutely. <laughs> so both of their works really look at universal um, morals. Actually, this, I'm just, I'll just read this question to you. Um, last question before we move on. Uh, can you speak to the universal morals truths and ethnocentrism so this is kind of large with regard to the work of lewis and tolkien that is a big question i'm going to just take a little a little a weak stab at it <laughs> sure. 
The universe, I think part of what brings them together, it's a great question if I understand it, I'll, I'll only answer part, a part of it here is, um, part of what really draws them together is a shared moral vision. Now, before Lewis becomes a Christian, that moral vision is a bit more limited. Uh, but, the, the, but the love of truth and the pursuit of truth is certainly uh, near the center of the thing. They really believe that truths exist. Um, and I can't, I can't quote it exactly there in The Lord of the Rings, but the idea that uh, uh, there's not one set of morals for hobbits, uh, one for elves, they apply across time, across centuries. And, and it's, a, it's a man's part to discern them, discern those moral truths, because our obligation is to order our lives and to submit our lives to those great transcendent truths. Now, of course, for Tolkien and Lewis, those truths are deeply rooted in the scriptures, in yes. the Christians, in the Jewish Christian scriptures. Mm -hmm. So they wanna, they, they're going to anchor that in Revelation. Um, you really can't understand the, their characters, the, the heroes, but also those who are really twisted and dark. You can't understand it without that, that moral vision. There is a moral good, and every, every single individual in their story is caught up in a great moral contest, this clash of truths and claim to truths and the will to power. So that's a stab at the question. Doesn't really answer it the way it ought to be, but I, I'll think more about it. <laughs> Wonderful. So I, I mean, we could, I could talk to you for, I've got about eight more questions that in my mind <laughs> that have come out of this, but there's something special that happens when friends come together to make art. And so I, I want to talk about the art that is coming out of your book. Um, the documentary um, yeah. called by the same name, A Hobbit, A Wardrobe, and A Great War. So Joe has been joined uh, by two friends, producers and filmmakers Ralph Linhart and Jock Peterson. So I'd like to welcome um, Jock Peterson and Ralph Linhart to our discussion today. Um, so uh, Ralph, say hello. Hello, how are you? Nice to see hello. you. Hello, nice to see you Thank too. You and and job. Oh, thanks. And Jock, say, let's say hello to you too. As, Hello, Amber. Thank you. Hello. Welcome. Now, I think Jock wins the uh, award for best background today because I'm <laughs> a little jealous of that music setup you've got back there. <laughs> so um, tell us what drew you to make this documentary? Uh, who? <laughs> you. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. Ralph. Well, any of you, okay. really. I mean, whose uh, idea? Well, yeah, Where uh, is the benefit? As, as I've known to, to ramble on, I'll keep it short. Uh, I'll have to say, and this is found, this is the C.S. Lewis Foundation's really uh, are responsible for this. Uh, I met Stanley Matson, the founder of C.S. Lewis Foundation, back in 1992 when I helped out with some videos that they needed. And it was over the last 20 years from that time that the message of, uh, of Lewis and of the foundation and of the ideas that you've been talking about really said, well, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to put out there? As Lewis said, often he says, in his book days, he said, you know, people won't read nothing. They'll either read good books or they'll read bad books. Well, I'm mm -hmm. a filmmaker, so either you're going to watch something good or you're going to watch something bad. And we felt that, uh, Joe, myself, and Jock felt that we weren't seeing what we wanted to see. So we went out and tried to do that. We're trying to produce what really we want to see is a story about the friendship of these two men that was so pivotal, not only to their writings, but to the reemergence of the ideas of heroism and, you know, and truth and love and all those, those great things that you and Joe have been talking about. Jock, would you like to add anything to that? Um, well, yeah, certainly the great thanks to uh, the C.S. Lewis Foundation for uh, sort of getting our start in this. Um, uh, once once we discovered Joe's book and uh, were able to build upon that. Um, one of the things I would just like to add to is a, a bit of the discussion that you were having earlier about a Amber, and I kind of feel jealous about, or uh, I'm guilty about this, is that you mentioned, you know, looking around you to know who and where these friendships, these these deep friendships that sort of spark and inspire your creativity come from or where they exist. And uh, one of the the values that, that I've got in this project is that I've, I've found that relationship and that relationship exists with these two guys that we've been on a journey together for the last, you know, two or three years. 
And uh, it's been, it's, it, it just continues to grow and the depth that we get out of it is so rewarding. Mm-hmm. Well, thank, Jock, thank you for that, uh, Brother Jock and, and Ralph. I mean, I feel exactly the same way. I have to say this mutual admiration society and we could not be more different in our personality and temperaments. <laughs> which, but which the New York accent no always wins. <laughs> which is not by no means the example that we've had for the foundation. Uh, you know, as as Joe said, we are so different. Yet the value of our difference is is the key to any success we're going to have. Having three of us that none of us ever agree on the same things has caused the creativity to go many levels higher than any individual effort could do. Hmm. And that's something that I learned from the foundation as well. All the events that the foundation does, they're the accumulation of a lot of people working really hard, but then creating something that's much larger than than the individuals involved. So again, it's an example uh, that I was privileged to have from the foundation. That is wonderful. How how do you feel like, um, what, well, what have you learned from this process? So first of all, tell me about the process. This is a five part documentary and you're almost done with the first part. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Well, I cannot wait to see it. Uh, I hear it's stuck in pr- post-production. Is that what's happening? Yeah, yeah that's okay. I yeah, just it. briefly. I mean, we've been stuck. Uh, uh, we're in, the film is essentially done, and we're in those final moments now, doing the final color correction, the scoring, and as everybody knows, a lot of things are closed. You know, we we've, we've had some great support from many vendors, uh, but Hollywood right now is closed. We can't get in to do our final correction in color and our scoring and our uh, our last post production elements. So that's really what's holding us up. As soon as the door is open, I, I think we're very, very close and we're very excited about that. I cannot wait. I, I think that's going to be fabulous. What is something that you have learned about yourself, about the war, about Lewis and Tolkien? Maybe, maybe each of you could say one thing that you've learned about this process of the documentary making um, that has been a new a thing for you. Wow. Jock? Um, sure, I'll start. <laughs> um, well, I mean, obviously, all that uh, all that Joe's presented in in the book and the information that's there is as much of it was new to me. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about um, sort of my contribution to this film is where I experienced the Lord of the Rings and Chronicles of Narnia came from when I was nine and ten years old. Mm-hmm. Um, where Joe experienced it, it was later in college where, you know, so it's like the, it, the impressions and the ideals that were generated by these books are very different between us, but knowing that the world is just adva- as vast, it's, it's so valuable to see like the nuances and the difference of like, it works at every level. You know, they both, they just, there's mm-hmm. so much, to feast off of at every level and every age. And uh, that's really been uh, uh, such a surprise to me as sort of to understand that. Wow, yeah. Yeah, if I could jump in here before Ralph does. Uh, thanks for that question uh, and a terrific question. I, one of the things that's been so striking uh, in Lewis's life and Tolkien's life and then kind of imitated in the way that the, the, the three of us have been working together is that they're chasing their callings uh, in wartime, because they're really writing their great epic works uh, through the Second World War. And they're, they're writing those things, not because they're actually even paid to write them. What they're paid to do is to, is to give lectures, to grade student papers, to do tutorials, to do scholarly academic work. Tolkien was not paid by, the, by Oxford to write The Lord of the Rings. Lewis was not paid by Oxford to write The Chronicles of Narnia or The Screwtape Letters but they took such great delight in that aspect of their imaginations. They just couldn't not work on those things on the off hours. And for these two gentlemen here, you know, uh, we're not really getting paid <laughs> to do <laughs> what we're doing. We're doing, because it, we, we love what we're doing. We love the chance to be together 
to work on this project because each of us, and it's tapped into an aspect of my own, you know, creative gifts such as they are that I didn't think I had. And these guys are forcing out of me, choking out of me with every film shoot. Well, uh, what I'd like to express about what I've learned, uh, especially here in episode one, because we, we rewind back to these men as, as boys and as, as of young men. And my perception of Lewis and Tolkien is this Oxford dawn, all the pictures we really see of them, they're old, they're, they're established, they're, you know, they're sages. And as we've expanded on episode one, it's seeing these guys grow up as young men and experiencing the war and what made them who they are. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's very different. It's very different to see we have these wonderful actors we, we've had involved who portray, you know, a 20-year-old Lewis and a 19-year-old Tolkien. Uh, and just imagining what they were experiencing, to think that the, in Lewis's case, someone who I see a lot of great theology come out, to have him write when he's 19 years old, you know, uh, some of the poems that speak of the absolute depression in his life. You know, and I, maybe Joe can quote some of those. Uh, I'm not as good at quoting of them, but, you know, they're, they just speak to a very different place than we've ever seen these gentlemen when we think of them as the, as the dons of Oxford. And that's a whole new dimension. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I cannot wait to see this episode. So the episode one is about their their younger life. Can you can you give us a, a bird's eye preview of the next four episodes? Are they sort of plotted out? Yes, they are. I'll do if I can do that quickly, gentlemen. If that's course. okay. I'll, I'll absolutely quickly, and then add on there, guys. I mean, episode two, uh, it will be the meeting. They they it'll be their first meeting there at Oxford. We'll take them through the 1920s. We'll we'll walk with Lewis as he moves from his atheism to the conversion in 1931, and we'll probably take episode two right up to 1933 with Adolf Hitler coming to power uh, there in Germany and the beginning of the gathering storm. That'll be episode two from the 20s right to about 1933. And then episode three will take us into the 30s now. The gathering storm is really gathering. And we'll see not only the emergence of the Inklings, their friendship, their deepening friendship, they're, they're beginning to write their work, some of their great uh, fictional works through the 1930s. So we'll figure out the rise of these totalitarian powers. They've got a ringside seat to it, uh, as we spoke, Amber. And we'll probably take it up to about 1940, I think, that, that episode three, where now it's the bombing of London and the Blitz. And I know the C.S. Lewis fans out there will know how the, how the Chronicles of Narnia begins with the children, the, Pen the Pevensey children being evacuated from London to go live into the house of an old professor. Well, that's the Second World War. That's the Blitz on London. So that's episode three. Uh, episode four will then, will kind of complete the story of their friendship and the creation of those works, the completion of those great works, episode four. Episode five then, I think it'll be the sort of question that we often get in uh, little seminars like this and I've gotten in different talks I've given is, well, what would Token Lewis say today? What issues would they be speaking about today? What would they say about this? How would they be reacting to this? Uh, and I think episode five is gonna, it's gonna tackle some of those questions, kind of Token and Lewis applied. And uh, we hope to be interviewing as many people as we can, uh, whether, they're, whether they're known uh, superstars and the celebrities or, or folks you've never met, whose lives have really been influenced by Tolkien and Lewis in their writings. That sounds amazing. I cannot wait <laughs> to have- You can't wait either. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, how can we be involved? Uh, how can we support uh, the work that you three are doing? Gentlemen? Well, at, at what, what's really exciting, uh, that if you've been involved with the C.S. Lewis Foundation at all, you have been involved. And we thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. There's no question that without Stanley Matson's support uh, as the founder of the C.S. Lewis Foundation, and without the folks uh, throughout the trailer, you know all those faces. They're all people who have done this for free, 
who are passionate about Lewis and Tolkien, but are also passionate about the foundation and the, and the goals of the foundation. If it was not for the love that all those people and the locations and all the uh, uh, extra assets that the foundation has helped us with, we wouldn't be where we are now. They got us going. Yes. So thank you for that. Yes. Uh, you know, we are a nonprofit, so we continue to, to work on, on you know, the, the funds of others, and we're thankful for that. And, and those who feel they want to do that, they continue to do that. The website, if you guys don't know, is hobbitwardrobe.com. You can watch the trailer then again there. There's also links to uh, a description of the other episodes. There's a link to the nonprofit. There's a link to uh, the people involved. Uh, and there's, of course, a link to donate. So uh, that's certainly one way. Uh, and of course, I wouldn't leave out that you keep thinking about us. Uh, and if that means prayer, definitely. If it means uh, clicking on the YouTube channel so we get more hits, great. Uh, whatever it is, tell your friends, you know, tell them to watch the trailer, tell them to, you know, uh, add to the conversation. That's really the best way you can help us, you know, and we appreciate it. Thank you so much. I think Chris, um, if you, uh, those of you at home haven't seen in the chat, so Chris Howell has put up the website uh, where you can support the movie and view the trailer. Gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for being on with us tonight. What a joy it has been to speak with all three of you. Uh, the work you've done, um, both in your individual you know, um, historian and filmmaking, and then how you've brought that together to make art that is compelling to us, that as an artist is, is a joy to watch and a joy to participate in. So thank you. Thank you, Amber. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to uh, remind all of us that this is the first of our webinar series that the C.S. Lewis Foundation is going to run between now and Oxbridge, July 2021. So do look out in your email for uh, the upcoming webinars, upcoming events that we'll be having in this year, this post, uh, this, the pause year. The, the, the gift of a pause year, shall we say, where we get to educate ourselves before we meet again in person. So I'd like to pray for us as we close. Uh, Lord, I have been so um, touched and encouraged tonight by looking at what you've done in the past. We're taught to look for what you've done in scripture. And we're taught for, to look at what you've done in the lives of saints. And we thank you so much for um, the work, the ongoing, tireless work that Tolkien and Lewis did in bringing your faith to life and changing the lives in those in many new generations and how that has sparked in Joe and Ralph and ja uh, Jock a, a, a desire to make new art. Lord, I wanna pray for each person here on this call that you would give us friendships that would share your gospel. Friendships like Lewis and Tolkien, friendships that are deep and are strong and would actually change lives and bring people to come to know you. Lord, would the work of the, the C.S. Lewis Foundation go forward in great strength and in peace. I ask all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night, everybody. We'll see you at the next webinar.